Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Not Your Mother's Goose podcast, a laugh-filled trip down memory lane where we get to make jokes at the expense of everyone from John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt to Baloo. I'm Topher Goggin. Coming up today, bring your rocks and breadcrumbs as we take a look back at the story of Hansel and Gretel, find out how Georgie Porgy's season of The Bachelor is going, and learn what the cow that jumped over the moon is up to these days. First, though, it's time to be my guest for a fresh look at the story where having the physique of a sofa is actually A-OK, Beauty and the Beast. Off we go. A handsome prince gets himself into a spot of bother one night when he rudely slams his front door in the face of an old hag stuck out in a storm. You see, it turns out this particular hag just finished a University of Phoenix course in witchcraft, and she retaliates by turning the snob of a prince into a hideous beast. She informs him that he will remain stuck as the beast formerly known as Prince until he both falls in love with someone and gets someone to fall in love with him. Preferably, these should be the same person. Also, he needs to do that before one of the castle plants dies, so he damn well be- Also, he needs to do that before one of the castle plants dies, so he damn well better help he didn't hire me to take care of it, as plantricide is one of my specialties. Years pass, and things are not looking so great for Mr. Beast's quest to find a gal. His attempts to meet someone on Love Connection are thwarted when Chuck Woolery won't return his phone calls, and one trip to the grocery store goes particularly poorly when the cashier offers to set his ugliness up with this cute wildebeest she knows down at the zoo. Everything changes one fateful night, though, when an old man gets lost in the beast's woods and has the misfortune of thinking it would be wise to knock on the first castle door he finds to ask for help. This, again, does not sit too well with the beast. You get the feeling the beast might have eaten an encyclopedia salesman or two over the years. This time he kidnaps his trespasser and throws the man into a dungeon, where the only forms of entertainment are old issues of Cat Fancy magazine and the second season of Full House on DVD. Rough night. Fortunately for the old man, though, his dingling of a daughter, appropriately named Belle, soon shows up at the castle on a brilliantly strategized rescue mission. Using skills she learned in a Dale Carnegie course, Belle schmoozes the beast and negotiates a clever trade where she agrees to chill out at the castle for a while and or the rest of her life, whichever comes later, in exchange for the beast letting her pops go free. Way to play hardball there, ma'am. Now, Belle turns out to be quite attractive, so the beast goes to work putting the moves on her. This includes enlisting the assistance of some singing furniture if you're relying on the Disney folk as your historical reference. Belle, of course, is not having any of the... Wait, what? She falls for this? Give me a break. This plan definitely would not work for me, and I'm not that ugly. But apparently, the next thing you know, Belle is all over the beast like she's auditioning to pose with Fabio on the cover of a supermarket romance novel. P.S. He still can't believe it's not butter. Thanks to them falling in love, the old hag's curse is broken. The beast ceases being beastly, and let me tell you, the before and after pictures make those extreme makeover shows look like an amateur hour. He and Belle settle into the castle for a long and happy life together. Admittedly, they do still have to convince a few of the transfigured staff members that, oh, of course you look better as a person than you did as an armoire. No, no, I'm not just saying that to be nice. Hey, hey, stop crying. Come back. I just meant that you hold a lot of junk in your trunk. Literally. Wait, hold, hold on. And on that note, it's time to move on to the news. I realize not everybody's got time to read the paper every day. You might need to get your news here. Don't worry, I've got you covered. Family members panic-stricken after Humpty Dumpty wins trip to Great Wall of China on game show. Baloo to challenge Joey Chestnut in televised banana-eating contest. And our lead story in entertainment news, so spoiler alert if you've been DVRing, ABC's Bachelor makes his choice. The 47th installment of ABC's reality dating show The Bachelor came to an end last night as Bachelor Georgie Porgy proposed to florist Mary Mary Quite Contrary. 
Porgy was one of the most audacious bachelors in the show's history, kissing 23 of the 25 girls over the course of the season, and leaving many of them in tears when they ultimately did not receive roses. In the final episode, Porgy shocked Contrary by reaching into his pants and whipping out an 8-inch cockle shell, which he presented to Mary along with a ring. Despite the show's abysmal track record, host Chris Harrison expressed confidence in the new couple's prospects. This time it's true love for sure, he told a TMZ reporter, while simultaneously purchasing a copy of Us Weekly that claimed that Porgy was actually having a secret affair with Contrary's aunt's hairdresser's cousin. Executive producer Mike Fleiss echoed Harrison's sentiment with a nearly straight face before adding, Oh, come on, who are we trying to kid here? It's time now for a quick commercial break. Let's find out what's going on in town tonight. Hey, diddle diddle, folks. Brian Weifrich here reminding you to come on down for the closing ceremonies of the Ferdinand County Fair tonight. The world's most famous motorcycle jumping cow is on her way to town, and this time she'll be flying over a different kind of full moon. After coming to fame as the cow that jumped over the actual moon, Lulu the Holstie traded in her sneakers for a Harley and now jumps celebrity moons, evil Knievel style, for charity. With a 77% career success rate, Lulu has thrilled crowds worldwide, clearing famous derrieres ranging from Kim Kardashian to Al Roker. She hopes to add one more picture to her famous wall of buns tonight as she tries to clear the deep pants rump of her own mayor, Ralph Duckworth. The festivities get underway at 8 with a musical performance by Sir Mix-a-Lot, followed by the ceremonial drawer dropping at 9. General admission passes will be on sale at the gate for just $10, with a limited number of Cheekside VIP seats still available. Get your tickets now. If you're not there tonight, you can kiss my ass. Thanks again to Brian Weefridge for his help on that one. I hope you get some of those fine Cheekside seats, Weef. Now let's get back to the news with some more headlines. Bo Peep outfits sheep with new tracking chips. Aging Rapunzel suffering from hearing loss tosses down her chair from tower. And in everyone's favorite, math news. Beyond Infinity, Sparks Fly at Math Convention as Buzz Lightyear debates experts. Fireworks erupted at the annual convention of the Mathematics Association of America as invited guest Buzz Lightyear of Star Command eviscerated a panel of PhDs in the group's annual keynote debate. The gathered calculator fans and multiplication buffs were on the edge of their seats, watching with rapt attention as Lightyear swatted away experts' criticisms that it is impossible to go beyond infinity. Calmly retracting the bubble over his head, Lightyear silenced his critics with multiple examples of numbers, quote, way past infinity, ranging from the amount of time you have to wait to talk to someone from the cable company to the number of calories in a taco salad. Lightyear even speculated that some numbers may exist beyond beyond infinity, but so far the only thing he's found that's close is Sheriff Woody's blood pressure. We also have this late-breaking story. Young boy changes name. A local 12-year-old boy is learning a new signature today after successfully petitioning the Superior Court to change his name. Formerly known as Jack Spratt Jr., the boy snuck away from his famously fatty food phobic father just long enough to file the request to change his name to Jack Sprockley. Asked by Judge Stuart McDougal why he wanted to do so, the boy pointed out that now Jack Sprockley will eat no broccoli. In a separate petition, Rumpelstiltskin Jones changed his name to Dave Jones. Hi, I'm definitely a real princess, so it's safe to uh, say I can't sleep on this mattress. Ow! What is that? So I'll be up all night listening to Not Your Mother's Goose. The Lion King. Up next, we'll take a visit to the Pride Lands, where a brand new lion cub named Simba has just been born. He's the son of King Mufasa, a big-ass lion who sounds a lot like Darth Vader, just without the sleep apnea machine. As we arrive, young Simba is being presented to the other subjugated animals by the local mystic-slash-medicine baboon, Rafiki. Okay, actually, he's a mandrel. Let's get that straight. But anyway, this process involves Rafiki hoisting the cub up in the air off the edge of a cliff 
in a ceremony that is basically a cross between Michael Jackson showing off blanket from the balcony and a 14-year-old desperately waving her phone around hoping to get better cell service when Snapchat goes down. After this understated introduction, young Simba grows up, hanging out with a gal lion named Nala and annoying the hell out of a bird named Zazu that gets stuck on 24-7 chaperone duty. Meanwhile, though, trouble is brewing in the form of Simba's Uncle Scar. By the way, nice name work there, parents. You've got a kid named Mufasa, and then you're just out of ideas, so you go with Scar? Come on. Good old Scar isn't too thrilled about being bumped down the monarchy pecking order, so he recruits his idiot hyena friends to help bump off everyone ahead of him on the list. They collectively lead Simba out into a gorge, then set off a wildebeest stampede by announcing a Black Friday sale at Yaks R Us. Mufasa shows up just in time to save Simba from the melee, but doesn't fare so well himself. Especially once Scar comes to the fake rescue and finishes him off. Sorry for making you relive that childhood trauma. It turns out that Simba's bad day is actually only going to get worse. Not only does he discover that his father has died, but Uncle Scar promptly stops by to mention that this is actually all Simba's fault. Scar convinces Simba that the best way to deal with this would be to move away. Permanently. Scar moseys back to Pride Rock, announcing that both Simba and Mufasa have croaked, and that he will be graciously saving the day by taking over as king. Simba, meanwhile, briefly gets lost and wanders onto the set of the Jungle Book, but then settles in with a wisecracking meerkat and a flatulent warthog instead. These two, Timon and Pumbaa, teach Simba their singable worry-free motto and life philosophy that we all have come to grow and love. Clap on. <laughs> Clap off. <laughs> anyway. As Simba grows up, complete with a terrible new haircut, the whole Pride Lands under new management thing isn't working out so well. Turns out that the scar economy is not great in certain industries, such as the catching food industry. One day, a now-grown Nala goes out to hunt and manages to catch only a Simba. Reunion time. And after they finish feeling the love tonight with Elton John, Nala suggests that Simba come back to take out Scar. Simba mulls it over and says, I think not. Never fear, though, as Simba gets over this brief bout of sanity very quickly. All it takes is one talking cloud formation that either looks a little like Mufasa, or maybe a 1987 Buick LeSabre, and Simba heads back to shut down the Scar show. One good cliff battle and a grass fire later, Pride Rock is saved. Simba takes over as king, he and Nala flip on the Elton John, and a while later Rafiki's back dangling the next kid off the edge of the cliff. I just hope that kid doesn't do his own stunts. Hansel and Gretel. You know, folks say that smartphones and GPS have destroyed everyone's sense of direction these days. Nobody under the age of 30 knows the real way to get from here to there. Of course, the way to do that is that you print out a page of MapQuest directions, you set them on your passenger seat, you're not able to look at them anyway because you're driving, and eventually you end up so lost that you can't even figure out how to get back to any of the roads that are on your printout. But, you know, it turns out that getting directions dates all the way back to fairy tale land, as we find our friends Hansel and Gretel out geocaching in the woods. Here are their secrets. If times are tough in your family of four, you might consider a variety of solutions. Store brand foods, carpooling, shorter showers, taking your kids out in the woods and leaving them, and so forth. In this particular story, a woodsman and his new trophy wife opt for door number four. Alas, Mr. and Mrs. Lumberjack are not about to win any awards for subtle planning. While some children have to worry about accidentally walking in on their dad getting busy with their stepmom, Hansel and Gretel instead wander in on their folks planning to abandon them in the forest. Rather than make a quick call to social services, however, Hansel spends his last few hours loading up his pockets with white rocks. When the parents then lead the kids off into the woods, Hansel calmly dribbles a, completely unnoticed, rock trail behind them, which he and his sister later follow straight back to their house under the moonlight. In a shocker, they don't get a terribly warm welcome upon their return. Before long, the woodsman's wife is again planning to fix her problems by abandoning the kiddos out in the middle of nowhere. Unable to get to his rocks, this time Hansel is forced to lay down a trail of breadcrumbs while he and Gretel are being led off into oblivion. This admittedly is not a horrible idea. It's definitely better than dropping, say, a trail of ice cubes. 
In the end, it doesn't work, though, as birds eat the crumbs and destroy the kid's map home. Now stranded for real, Hansel and Gretel wander around for a few days until they stumble onto one of your more common sights deep in the forest, a house made entirely out of candy. So logically, they start eating it. For the second time this episode, that leads to a homeowner that is less than pleased. But this time, instead of a prince-turned-beast, it's a terrifying old witch. She's nearly blind, but she takes the tack of promising the kids real food, which probably means drywall, and soft beds to lure them inside because her real plan is to pork them up and eat them. Because there's nothing like a delicious German child when you live in a house made entirely of candy. The witch forces Gretel to be her slave and locks Hansel in a cage for feeding. Despite some tricks by Hansel to convince her that he's still skinny, the witch eventually loses her patience and orders Gretel to fire up the oven. Then, as Gretel preheats to 400 degrees, the witch decides she'd also like some Gretel gruel for an appetizer. She slyly tells Gretel to lean into the oven to see if it's hot enough. Gretel's no idiot, though. She responds with the famous, Oh, I don't understand what you mean. How about you get into the oven and show me how trick? Which somehow totally works. Gretel slams the oven door shut. Crisis averted. Though I do hope that oven is self-cleaning. Prior to getting the hell out of there, Hansel and Gretel prudently scope out the house and discover that the witch's love of candy was closely rivaled by her propensity to hoard valuable jewels. The kids loot the place and take off for home, which they now somehow know how to locate. Maybe the blind witch also owned a lot of maps. When they get there, they learn that their bitchy stepmother is conveniently croaked. And once they ship the witch's jewelry off to cash for gold, the kids and the woodsmen are pretty much set for life. Now somebody just needs to call Dateline NBC. Listen, we all have that friend that loves Disney just a little too much. You know who this person is. They're the ones who make a chain to count down the number of days to their next trip to the Magic Kingdom, which they refer to as going home. They're the ones that correct you if you say Thunder Mountain instead of Big Thunder Mountain. Now, in my personal group of friends and so forth, that annoying Disney person is, well, it's me. Uh, so trust me, I know what I'm talking about here. But how do you deal with someone like this? Well, I thought I would help you out. I initially tried to write a supercalifragilisticexpialidocious parody, something like Finding Nemo, Little Mermaid, Snow White, Cinderella. If you don't like Disney movies, you can go to hell. But beyond that, I, I couldn't get it to work. But I have come up with a backup plan. When your Disney-loving friend starts annoying you with factoids, what you want to do is come back with some trivia of your own. Your facts won't actually be true, but that's just a minor detail. Hit your friend with a few of these, and you will shut them up for good. Uh, as a side note, I actually wrote these initially as a whole series of fake Disney facts for a chain, for a Disney trip, and that's where these come from. It turns out that some other people actually run a fake Disney facts Instagram account, uh, they take a little different angle on this than I did, but it's some funny stuff, so feel free to check that out. But anyway, here are some Disney facts that you might want to throw at your magic-loving friends. For instance, did you know that in 1979, Disney scrapped plans for a new men's-only theme park known as Disneyland? Its signature attraction was the Mano Rail. Or, you may not be aware that if your Space Mountain rocket finishes the track in under two minutes... All riders on board receive a coupon for 50 cents off a Mickey pretzel. Movie trivia. Did you know that during filming of Lady and the Tramp, things were delayed for three weeks when Lady came down with a case of fleas? One thing Disney really prides itself on is safety. In fact, an emergency psychiatrist is permanently on staff inside It's a Small World to assist guests that have mental breakdowns from hearing that song. There's been a lot of news lately about Disney building a new Star Wars-themed resort. Guests staying there can actually charge their mobile devices by having the Emperor shoot electricity out of his fingers and straight into the phone. If you've watched the movie Robin Hood, you of course know that there's a vulture in it named Nutsy. But you might not know that Nutsy went on later to a career in adult films. He didn't have to change his name. 
Songwriter Ray Gilbert got the title of zippity doo from a friend who had a painful zipper incident in a restroom that he termed a zip of the doo For anyone just joining us, we're going over a series of important Disney facts that are quite interesting and suffer only from the problem that they're not true, such as the idea that every night at midnight, Cinderella Castle turns back into a Motel 6. The Tiki Birds fan club, known as the Tiki Nerds, has recently had an explosion in popularity and now has six members. Here's one last detail you can share with your friends. Most folks know that there's a secret network of tunnels underneath the Magic Kingdom, but are they aware that Disney wanted to add similar tunnels under Animal Kingdom, but had to scrap the idea when a rhinoceros got stuck in a tight corner? I've got a couple hundred more of these on my list, but since I know when it comes to Disney, I'm that guy. Any Laugh Floor fans out there? Uh, but I'll spare you the rest. Otherwise, you might get a fast pass to skip to the end of this segment. All right, that's going to bring this episode of Not Your Mother's Goose to a close. There's more to come, though, so be sure to catch us next time. We'll dust off our magic lamps with Aladdin, review the fox and the hound, and fire up some more music on Rapunzel's jukebox. Thanks again to Brian Weefrich and my mom for help with this one, and thanks to you for taking the time to listen and make this show possible. I'm Topher Goggin, signing off for now. The goose is loose. I'll see you again soon on Not Your Mother's Goose. You've been listening to a Podmany original production. Thank you. Podmany. Thank you.